If 2020 is good for one thing, it's for spaceflight. With more than 500 satellites put into orbit just this year, the project of permanent human presence on the moon and now the target on Mars, this has stimulated the space industry and it's now private firms like never before. So with this new gain momentum, the industry requires a new generation of space propulsion systems that are more efficient than the status quo. Rocket engines that would cut costs, uh, cut fuel costs, increase the thrust to mass ratio as they would need less fuel and decrease environmental impact. I got the chance this summer to work on a candidate to this new generation of rocket engines, the Rotating Detonation Engine, or RD for short. This new engine concept uses pressure gain combustion with one or more detonation waves propagating in an annular combustion chamber. And using detonation and its supersonic propagating speed to combust your propellants instead of conventional deflagrative combustion is expected to down the line provide key fuel savings of up to 25%. However, there's one fundamental flaw in the engine concept. By having these multiple supersonic detonations waves wrap around your, your annular combustion channel and combusting more reactants at a frequency of 10,000 Hz, this causes an extreme environment where temperatures can rise north of 3,000 Kelvin. This extreme environment, uh, with this extreme environment, the engine quickly overloads and overheats, softens and effectively destroys itself. So I spent the last four months finding a way and ways to make this engine thermally stable and operational for longer burns. This is a milestone that would allow an eventual flight. I was lucky enough to work in a group that already had an RD design, so many thanks to Sean Connolly Boutin, I was able to base myself off of his MK2 design. To approach this objective, I had to separate the engine in two. Um, some core parts of the engine, like the plug and the injector, here in red, are supported well enough and experience stress in a fashion that allows to replace the current mild steel with thermally resistant materials like silicon carbide. Some other parts, like the other combustion chamber and the pintle injection system, are subject to such major loads, stresses and other shear forces that they do require the mechanical properties of steel. In these conditions, I kept the metal but implemented an inner circuitry of liquid cooling channels to allow the extraction of this extra heat. So how exactly did I proceed? The inner core components are subject to two major stresses in the case of uh, the inner cores uh, of the rocket. Uh, radial compression and heat. There is one class of materials that are excellent in both compression and heat resistance. Uh, they are so good at those two things that we actually use them in our car brake systems. Ceramics. They are excellent heat shields. In the case of silicon carbide, they can have a very low thermal conductivity at 0.81 watts per meters times Kelvin and can operationally resist to temperatures around 1800 Kelvin. However, ceramics are usually only used in heat shields, heat shield tiles like for the space shuttle as they are very difficult to manufacture and machine. So integration in a rocket engine is usually not possible. Yet there is a way. It is possible to synthesize ceramics like silicon carbide with pre-ceramic polymers like polysiloxane, which uses a polymer as binding agent between the ceramic molecule, allowing the, mo the material to be shaped through fused deposition uh, modeling, which is essentially 3D printing. After the complex geometry of the injector is printed, the polymeric compound can be extracted through pyrolysis, a combustion in an inert atmosphere, leaving only the ceramic compound behind. There is a considerable volume loss, but it's constant and can be compensated in design. The plug and injector are then fully made of these ceramics. Then, for the outer uh, portion of the engine that still requires the physical properties of metal, I opted for a liquid-cooled inner lining instead of the traditional radiator coils to increase the high temperature gradient areas uh, and in co consequence increase the heat flux, which advantages outweigh a lot the increased complexity and, uh, manufac in manufacturing and design. The initial base design follows the principle of using water as a higher, at a higher velocity, so smaller cooling channels to continuously maintain a greater temperature gradient between the heat source, or the combustion chamber wall, and the water. Water flows in directly to the hottest part of the design, then is pumped out, pulling the heat out with it. To optimize this concept, I've used flow simulation software to study the heat exchange for a given velocity, geometry, and volume of water. After many iterations, I finally succeeded in finding the right initial conditions of the fluid flow to stabilize the engine's temperature after 80 seconds at a comfortable average temperature of 534 Kelvin. But obviously, average temperatures don't take into account the local capacities of the material. So here is the stable maximum, maximal local temperature of the plug, which reaches 1122 Kelvin, uh, which is under the operating temperature of silicon carbide, which goes from 1200 Kelvin to 1700 1800 Kelvin. And we have a 
a stable maximal local temperature at the steel combustor as well of 530 Kelvin, which is under the operating temperature of mild steel of 800 Kelvin. The cooling system, which produced a max heat flux of 10 million watts per meter square, theoretically made this RDE suitable for long duration hot fires. However, this is important. It is important to note that the extraction of this heat is by essence a loss in efficiency. But the result of this project serves as a groundwork, as groundwork, sorry, for a future cryogenic version of the RDE, which would use regenerative cooling and reduce this energy loss to a minimum. Thank you for your attention, and please don't hesitate to contact me for further questions.